Thanks, George. Um, can everyone can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay. Cool. Um, right. So, as I understand, like right now we have a discussion that should last forty minutes. Although Friday, I think it went on for an hour or so. So, we'll we'll see what happens. How long people want to stay around? Um, the general way in which I plan to go about this um, is I will give kind of a little summary of of the talks given, and I'll go through three questions for each person. Two are kind of like a little bit more specific to their talk, and one is will be like more of a general question that they'll probably not be as as comfortable answering. Um, the scheme will be that I'll go through this for each speaker separately, and then I'll give the speaker a few times, a, a few minutes to answer uh, the questions that to, to, to the amount that they see fit, so they don't have to touch on every single point of the question, but just try and answer everything there to as amount as you see fit. And then after that, um, we'll give open the floor to kind of an open discussion to whoever um, wants to ask any questions we could do kind of like a raising a raising hand feature or something or or say a question in the chat um so i guess i'll start with um masuro shibata's talk who i think is not here um so maybe actually after we can open discussion on this if anything has if anybody has something to say otherwise we can move forward um so he gave a really interesting talk on neutron star mergers and the effect of viscosity effects um, so, and he claimed that he used a simplified Israel Stewart formulation and we had um, effects from magnetohydrodynamics and an effect of viscosity that showed up. Um, so one question um, immediately that you have here is what is the role of the effect of viscosity in this formulation? And how do we understand this in a physical sense? What is being dissipated? And in a more formal sense, like where do they enter the equations and why? And I guess part of this is related to the angular momentum transport. So how do we understand the angular momentum transport? Um, more deeply here. Um, there's also this question of the time scale differences that sparked a few that sparked um, a, a few discussions. Uh, so there's this time scale difference between the neutrino physics and the molecular physics of the neutron star. Um, this constitutes an important physics in an important part of the physics in these in these simulations. So how should we understand the physics of the interaction between these separated systems? Do we have to do these things Simultaneously, as far as my understanding from his talk, he did not do them. He didn't solve the molecular part as like a background on the neutrino physics, as far as my understanding was. But um, should we be doing that instead? Should there be a background there? Should be, there be some sort of interaction? If not, why not? And generally, where do we go from here in simulating neutron star mergers? And what does what is what are what is Masuro doing here that um, is not included in other things? And what is he doing here that is included in other things and what needs to still be included. Um, so I know he's not here, but does anybody have any comments on these? Uh, sure, I can jump in. Well, I mean, the problem is, uh, the context where this is relevant is the after merger of two neutron stars that are on the low mass side. So you're gonna have a long lived remnant. Once you have, once you turn that knob, you allow that scenario to take place. So then all, issues in long time scale play a significant role. If you effectively move angular momentum away from the kind of the core region of that form, newly formed object to the, outs to the outskirts, you could induce a collapse of the black hole. Uh, so that's a, that's a key ingredient. Also, there is a lot of thermal support in the problem uh, and hence the uh, microphysics needs to be taken into account and because you can lose a lot of energy through neutrinos. So the, unfortunately, as you uh, expressed several times, the scales are far from what one can regionally achieve. So the neutrino problem is, a, is an intrinsically a seven dimensional problem. So everyone is cutting corners one way or another to try and incorporate that. So that improving that is gonna be a long process forward, which uh, will be important. The, the then magnetic effect effects are or could be very important. And so as he was emphasizing, he was trying to include some effects of viscosity due to magnetic effects on scales that are still not achievable yet. So then this alpha viscosity parameter comes in to somehow effectively try and, and take into account that thing that is happening at scale you're not seeing. So this kind of begins to uh, bring memories of large, large eddy simulations uh, and somehow uh, bring in some effective terms that build in. So I'm 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 um, I'm neither pessimistic nor optimistic here. I'm just saying there is a long way forward, and anything, 
anyone is doing right now is to some strong degree wishful thinking. So we're, we're on, and I include myself there. So when we in, implement some neutrino transport with some um, uh, symmetry or some effectively some effective way of reducing the cost of the computation, we're making choices and those choices can be affecting the physics that we're getting out. Of course, it will depend on how long this object lasts. If it lasts for a full second uh, or collapse after 10 milliseconds, the degree of wrongness that the simulations or the, the computations will obtain will be different. So unless there is a very sensible way to use I don't know, pick or any kind of Boltzmann type description to inform better what are these effective um, terms that one should be considering, uh, it will still be a long way forward to try and, and uh, gradually increase the faithfulness of, of simulations. And different members of different groups in the numerical relativity community are tackling some of these things in a piecemeal approach in a very similar way to what uh, people in the core collapse supernova are doing. Okay, thanks a lot. That, I think that was, I covered a lot of the question there. Um, one thing before I move on is that I'll just ask anyone who's a co-host, if you want to ask a question, just please press the yes button instead of the instead of the raise hand button because I don't have access to the chat here while, while I'm sharing my screen or at least I don't know how to have access to it. Oh, I guess I do. Oh, never mind. I do have access. So if you'd like to write question, actually that works too. Um, but uh, Travis, Travis, can I add something? Well, yeah, yeah. I was gonna get next. Yeah, so next please, Elias, I know you have your, your hand up here. So if you would go ahead and... Thank, thank you. So, so one thing I would like to I would like to add to to I mean, Lewis basically captured like all the essence of everything already. But one thing I would like to add is, I think there are like two ways of thinking about viscosity in the system. Um, one way is, I mean, thinking really about the the physical viscosity that you have in the merger, and the other thing is thinking about effective viscosities that you have. This is mainly the magnetic field, and the reason, at least in my opinion, why people think about viscosity in that context, also the simulation that Mazaru was showing. I mean, there was a two-dimensional simulation, right? And the question is, okay, effectively you're saying, you know, this should all be magnetically driven, but why does it put viscosity? The reason is that in 2D, um, there is a so-called anti-dynamo theorem. So when you think about magnetic field evolutions in 2D, it's simply wrong. Like all the turbulence would after some time die out. So he has no other way in saying, you know, he wants to simulate seconds after the post-merger by doing a dimensional reduction that simply doesn't work with the full theory of MHD. So he has to take um, viscosity here as kind of, you know, coming in to save the day to effectively model that effect and then to provide some crude answer. I mean, that said, using like an alpha viscosity is not like the ultimate answer. It gives you kind of the wrong turbulence, but it's kind of a way forward. And so viscosity is kind of just, you know, the intermediate step to go here. Um, the other thing that, that people think about, I mean, when you think in, in terms of this, this modified orca bulk viscosity or other like heat conduction that, that might happen um, at the merger itself. I mean, this is something where, you know, I, mean, I, I guess people from heavy iron might be more, um, you know, in, inclined to help us out there because um, there, I think you really need some more, some more inspiration or some more physical input, like on the effective um, kind of um, viscosities that, that we could put there. And even though we might not resolve all the turbulence, I mean, thinking of these large eddy uh, simulations that, that are currently being put forward by, by Carlos Palenzuela and, and his group and also by other people, I mean, maybe this is at least some way forward people, people can go to include that, but in principle, if you, if you think about like putting all of those different uh, pieces of physics in and seeing, for example, as, as Mazaru did with, you know, putting like some fixed value of, of, the, of the shear viscosity, maybe you want to see what happens if you put a fixed value of bulk viscosity or, 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 or like a different viscosity, just to see what's the kind of maximum effect you expect and then where you might end up if you go to a more realistic direction. But I think this, this still remains to be explored. Cool. All right, thanks a lot. Does anybody... Does anybody have anything else they want to discuss or add here? Um, I think that was, at least for me, it was a useful discussion, I hope, for, for other people as well. Um, so we'll move on then, if no one has anything else to say. Um, we will move on to Lewis, uh, Lewis Leonard, I think, if I hopefully pronounce that correctly. Um, Hydrogen inspirations for gravity and beyond GR. He gave a really interesting talk where he kind of showed that you know, you can incorporate into GR these these regulators that are these the independent dynamic regulators that enter in your equations in the sense that they, in the same way that they do for an Israel Stewart kind of equation, right? So, um, and 
there's a lot of discussion on what these regulators, what, what this means and what they do. Um, I guess I'll just start here by asking, well, well a strong dependence on Lambda, uh, which was kind of like this, this time scale, really kind of like the relaxation time in Israel Stewart formulation, uh, strong dependence on Lambda means that we should not trust the, uh, the fixed quote unquote solution as a representative solution as a real problem. Does this necessarily work the other way? That is like, if, if just because my system is not dependent on this time scale Lambda, does that mean that now this has to be a representative solution of the real problem? Um, why or why not? Uh, how should we understand the differences in physics that come from cascading to UV versus cascading to IR? Uh, does this require a physical interpretation of the introduced dynamic degree of freedom of the regulator? So in, in Israel Stewart, the regulator has a has a has an as a interpretation of of being um, the viscous part of the of the of the engine momentum tensor. So it's like a real physical part of the energy momentum tensor. Um, and I believe that in GR, I think there was a paper from from Lewis yourself where it was kind of related to the mass. And there's is there always this or to the mass in the field. Is there, is there always this kind of like physical interpretation for this regulator? And I guess a general question would be, how should we understand the correlation between hydrodynamic theories and GR in the way that they're solved in the, in the physical sense? What's the nature of how these things are related and, and how deep is it? And so I'll give you some time to answer these questions, kind of like how you see fit, and then we'll do some discussion. Thank you, Travis. I, I like how you pose your questions. I mean, uh, you, you seem to be more provocative or, uh, than I am. And, uh, but I, I really enjoy this, this way of thinking. I think this is the right, it's, it's a, these are precisely the questions that one should be uh, trying to answer or at least, at least give some, some argument for. So with respect to the first point, I actually think the answer is yes, uh, but it also depends how you're going to do things. So um, I, we have explicit examples of some theories where you do have the full theory, then you do the CFT reduction, and then you end up with these theories that have the, all these problems, then you do introduce this fixing. And to the extent that the correcting terms remain small, if you do it a la, uh, in, the, in this fixing way or kind of inspired from, uh, by Israel Stewart, you do see that you recover the correct solution, you have a good sense of what this extra field is. And it somehow is, if you choose this, the relaxation of time the right way, you actually can make a connection with that mass scale that the field that you integrated out uh, is bringing kind of in disguise through the extra term is, terms in the action. So I, I do think that there is, um, but uh, having said that, I, my problem with this reduction of order approach is that does it iteratively is that it might work very well in a nest scattering matrix kind of calculation, but in this, in, in the regime that where we want to apply it, which is kind of several orbits or many, many orbits of a binary system, the secular effects can build up, the secular errors can build up and you can end up with the solution that's way off. So even though the terms, the correcting terms can stay small and would be fine staying small, the error that you make could accumulate to give you a solution that could be a representative solution to the of the problem you should get, but not the solution to the, the initial condition you have set for. Uh, so that would be my, my response to the first point. Then the second point, I think this is a crucial question. Um, if I put my hat on the EFT side and, and, and the EFT was constructing under the assumption that these terms are small, I either have done a gradient expansion or say what would be very natural in the case of, uh, of extension to general activity is to construct an action that is a richer scalar plus a whole bunch of terms that depend on the curvature. Uh, so you're building those, assuming that those extra terms, higher order curvature are small. So if you now your system truly goes into the UV and there is nothing that cuts it off in the sense of, oh, there is a black hole, a large black hole that pops up and hides uh, that region away from you. Um, then having gone into UV kind of invalidates your EFT. Your, the, the, what you've learned is a set of conditions that you started with um, for a while, okay, it's represented by that action that you wrote, but after some time, it's no longer possible to, to claim that that action has anything to do with the physical setup that is evolving naturally. Uh, with respect to that physical degree of freedom, the regulator, I actually think that indeed that these extra fields that you are adding, the time scale does 
kind of represent this um, some extra energy time scale in your system. And these fields are just making it very evident. So now if you see some dependency of that tau or that of the time relaxation parameter, which would be related to the mass in the way we think, um, your once what this would be telling you, the, we will tell you that once you access that regime, you're either have, having some small corrections or if those corrections become order one, again, I would go back to the previous one and I think, well, you've gone beyond what you truly can say, can, can recognize as a correction uh, or, or the principles over which you build the, the extensions uh, that you wrote. Um, so how will we understand the correction between hydrodynamic theories and GR and the way they are solved in the physical sense? I think this is a very broad question uh, and I'm not sure what you are after here so I can make some comments. So there is a sense in which, as I said very quickly towards the end of my talk, uh, fluid and gravity are the same thing provided you're thinking of gravity as in GR in, uh, in the context of a negative cosmological constant. So to second order in an expansion, expansion, you can see that one gives you the other one. So if you take general relativity, for those of you that have not seen this before, if you take general relativity, you insist in studying say large black holes in, in some sense, and that you're looking at pertur some perturbations of those black, those black holes, the solution expanded in a gradient way is one-to-one -one corresponding to uh, hydrodynamics to second order in that gradient. Interestingly though, you could even argue if you are very gung-ho that generativity in IDS is precisely the completion of hydrodynamics. So if you were to be able to uh, compute arbitrary uh, number of gradients but to arbitrary high order and you resum, it should give you GR. So from that point of view, you could say, well, I can explore GR and try to learn from GR in that context of new things in hydrodynamics. So you'll be bringing the gravity into the hydro to inform some things. And this is something Michal and collaborators have looked at uh, us, uh, for a while. Um, the opposite also works, and this is something we've done. So you can look at hydrodynamics, you say what cute features are there, which we didn't have any uh, intuition for before, uh, and actually find new phenomena in, G in gravity itself. So in the past, people would have said, there is no way you can have turbulence in, in, in gravity. And you can use this relation to show that indeed there is turbulence in gravity and how it should manifest. It's short-lived, et cetera, but there's there is a lot of one-to-one -one correspondence. So I'm not, sh I'm not sure if that's what you're thinking, but there is a lot of interplays that one could go uh, into uh, one another. And there are further things. Um, there is uh, a way to encode hydro in terms of a more general scalar uh, functions that depends on uh, some phase space values. Uh, so given that you can do that, and this is some work that we've done in the past with uh, Oscar Reula and Marcelo Rubio, you could end up saying, oh, there, maybe there is a way to also encode gravity in a single scalar function of an enlarged phase space. I mean, there is a lot of things that one can go and try to have fun with, with but I'm not sure if this is what you're, what you're thinking about. No, I, I, think, I think that when I pose a general question, I did pose it very broadly and very generally. So this is certainly in the direction of what I was, what I was thinking. Um, however, I mean, there is no, there's no Israel Stewart, like, so, so the ADS, I mean, what you're talking about the hydro the, and the one-to-one -one correspondence between the gradient expansions is, 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 is gradient expansion hydro, but it's also, there's no, there's no Israel Stewart, uh, as far as I understand, there's no, there's no way to make that correspondence to Israel Stewart type theories of hydrodynamics. There is for the gradient expansion, but not, but not for, for Israel Stewart. But then you have this talk here where you talk about how you can introduce Israel Stewart-like regulations into GR itself. So I wonder if this is something that we've yet to explore and maybe that this kind of correspondence exists there as well. And I think it's interesting that that you that you say that these, that you re do require phys physical interpretation for these extra degrees of freedom because they're somehow incorporate time scales that already existed in the theory. And now we're just kind of like ad hocly making them manifest. And now we're just solving this thing that hopefully isn't too dependent on this Lambda parameter. Yeah, so I think, oh, well, I don't want to start the discussion. So if anybody has anything else to say, I mean, let, me, let me just reply with just one comment. So, I mean, I like where you took it, but just, just uh, I limited myself to saying 
this Israel Steward like things that we're doing is for extensions of GR. So once you take GR and add stuff to it, then right. that's when we bring this kind of thought to control the behavior just as you do it on the hydrodynamic front. Sure. So uh, can, can I have a question to Luis on, on, on this one, along these lines? Please, absolutely. Uh, so, so Luis, so, so when you uh, formulate something like Israel Steward, you probably need a vector field that picks uh, a time direction, right? Because like in, in Israel Steward, you have like co-moving uh, flow velocity, yes. right? Yes, yeah, indeed. You're, you're, you will be breaking Lorentz invariant in the UV, let's say. Uh, so, so you want to think about this vector, this direction as a some fixed direction, or you want to th think of it as some dynamical field that uh, is going to have its own equations of motion? Well, the dynamic of the dynamic of fields that have their own equation of motion, you're dissipating, or in some sense, you're saying, if I'm going, if I'm evolving in this direction to the future, I want these extra fields to asymptote to this combination of my original fields. And then as a result, you're saying, well, in the opposite direction, the opposite is going to happen. So you are breaking uh, Lorentz invariance that way on the UV side. So uh, they, they come hand in hand. Thanks. All right. Great discussion. Thanks, Luis. Um, so um, I, have a, I have a comment, oh. maybe. Uh, um, me. is, is um, there, there uh, might not be too much time left. Uh, we have... Okay. Yeah, we have two questions now uh, from you and Pavel Kopton. If we have time at the end, we can come back to these, um, but I'll be, I'll be keeping track. I mean, it will also depend on, the last time we did an hour instead of 40 minutes. So maybe if people want to stick around, we can come back to these two, these questions at the end too. But I just want to make sure we get to every speaker. So I'll try not to hog the discussion this time on my end. Um, but yeah, so here we'll go to Marcelo Descanzi, who gave us a talk on general relativistic viscous fluid dynamics where he, um, in, introduced and went through a little of the BDNK formalism stuff that we've already had discussed on Friday a bit. Um, so I'll just go right to the questions in the interest of time. Uh, shocks seem to be an important but slippery concept discussed. Uh, should shocks generally be part of a hydrodynamic theory or not? That is, why should we require that a hydrodynamic formulation can accommodate for them? And what does it mean if it can't? Um, in the context of Luis's talk, what kind of fix is this to the lambda echo style hydro? Does this does the regulation have a physical interpretation in this theory? Um, and a general question: Is the unification of hydrodynamic formulation something you see as a possibility? If so, is the next step to derive IS and a BDNK like formulation, or is this probably not possible? And if not, what does that mean? Um, so, you, I can give you like five minutes to answer these how you see fit, and then open up the discussion. To yeah, sure. Uh, well, regarding the shocks, uh, I, I think it's I, I think it's desirable to try to describe the shocks because uh, as long as you can formulate the equations in a meaningful way uh, and say that uh, after you have some type of singularity, you can still meaningfully talk about a solution under this sort of criteria like the Rankine, Huygenot, or whatever other criteria you want to use. Uh, I, I, I don't see why you should throw out, you know, your uh, your theory or your equations of motion at that point. But uh, but uh, that, that that that's debatable. And if some people think that at some point when you have some type of shock forming, uh, you should not trust your theory anymore. Uh, that might be the case. Uh, but but still, uh, even if that's the case, you still want to understand uh, what kind of initial conditions can lead to singularities. So even if you take the point of view of saying, okay, so every time that a singularity or a shock forms, I'm going to throw out uh, my theory and say that I'm beyond the limit of validity of the theory or something like that, uh, you, you still want to sort of you know, make a map of your space of initial conditions and understand, okay, so this set of initial conditions lead to a shock, these exist for all time and things like that. So uh, I, I think that, that the work of trying to understand when shocks arise or not, uh, is relevant regardless of how your point of view is uh, of what you should think of the equations once you have a shock. Uh, so to the second point, um, so does the regulation have a physical interpretation in this theory? Uh, yeah, that, that's a hard question. Uh, it, it doesn't have uh, a clear interpretation, like for example, because you have this new transport coefficients, basically. I think that's all your question, right? What is the, the, the new interpretation of, what is the physical interpretation of the new transport coefficients? Uh, and they, they don't have like a, a clear interpretation like in the case of bulk viscosity or uh, shear viscosity, for example. Uh, 
uh, on the other hand, you see that they have to be there for the theory to be causal. So, uh, uh, and if you take that causality as a physical, an important physical property, uh, there must be some way of thinking of these coefficients as related to some underlying property of the theory that uh, is related to causality. But uh, I myself can, cannot put my finger exactly what this has to be. And uh, if Colton and George want to jump in, because they, they thought more about this than, than myself. So if after I finish, they, they might make comments on, the, on this question. And about the uh, unification of hydrodynamics, uh, I think that would be a wonderful thing. I think it sounds like something really hard uh, to accomplish. Uh, and but uh, my initial guess, without uh, you know, committing to anything, my initial guess that probably that's not possible because as I was saying during my talk, during the Q&A, that uh, if you just look at initial conditions, for example, for Israel Stewart, you're gonna be able to map one-to-one -one initial conditions that are given energy momentum tensor for uh, this first order formulation, that's not the case, right? Uh, so I think that, I think a rephrase of this question is the following, okay, even if they, you cannot unify things, uh, are the differences between what you measure, let's say in Israel, Stuart, or the BDNK theory, are the different actors something measurable, something that makes a difference? Or maybe they're gonna differ only uh, in some regime where you don't trust the theory anymore, or the difference are gonna be so small uh, that you don't care. Uh, and, that, and, and to that, I'm gonna just say what I said during the uh, Q&A in my talk, is like, I think you can only uh, you can try to do some background develop calculation, but I think in reality, you just have to kind of you know, run realistic numerical simulations and really compare these things. Uh, otherwise, I think we're just gonna, I don't know, just, just making guesses. Um, so th does that cover your three? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, so if, I, if anyone has any doubt or any questions they wanna, they wanna <laughs> ask Marcelo. Um, I can comment on um, some, some some of this um, uh, some of these topics. Uh, so number two uh, is the physical meaning of this regulator. Um, I don't think one can say anything about the physical meaning of the regulator except that this represents the UV of the theory. So they represent uh, some microscopic degrees of freedom that are um, the physics of the microscopic degrees of freedom that are parameterized. Uh, by those uh, transport parameters. I don't even want to call them transport coefficients. I would call them transport parameters. Uh, and it, it's really like um, choosing a regulator in quantum field theory. You know, do you choose like hard UV cutoff? Do you choose Pauli Villars? Do you choose, uh, you know, high derivative? This is like a high derivative regularization. Um, so it's it's up to you, right? It's so the way the way I view this is is that you know the freedom in choosing these coefficients is literally like the freedom of choosing the UV regulating quantum field theory. And the last question here is you know unification of hydro Israel Stewart and BDNK. Um, I don't think that these these things are somehow are antagonistic. Like where does Israel Stewart come from? Israel Stewart comes about from the following you know setup. People say oh. Let's go to the Landau frame. Oh, things are bad. So let's fix the badness by introducing this Israel Stewart stuff. Well, <laughs> well, <laughs> let's not make the first wrong step. Let's not go to the Landau frame. Then there is no need to introduce Israel Stewart whatsoever. However, if you choose to do so, let's go to the most general frame. This, uh, within this BDNK theory that makes your theory stable and causal. Now, on top of that, you can throw in all these Israel Stewart things if you want to. You don't have to, but if you want to, you could. Right? So, so um, I think as uh, George um, emphasized, um, um, you know, BDNK is what <laughs> Landau, Landau's theory should have been <laughs> in the 1950s. Uh, and um, you know, MIS is really should be built on top of that. It could MIS could be built on top of Landau frame hydro, or it could be built on top of you know general frame hydro. But there is some hydro on top of which it is supposed to be built. But right. Pavel, can I can I can I raise something up? Um, just just to be provocative, I actually would disagree with what you just said. So to the point of BDNK, whatever uh, is fine to first order. Um, if I go again back to the particle uh, assumption and I'm building uh, up after iterating different moments in my theory, 
there is nothing in principle that should stop me to first order. I could go to any order I should want. If I want to stop at order 25th, I should be able to go there. Regardless of what theory I have, once I have higher and higher derivatives, I'm gonna end up screwed up. I'm gonna to have to do something to fix all these problems at the higher order, truncated at any, at any order is fine. So maybe this, your, your BDNK, fix it to first order. But if you go to second order, you're gonna, sooner or later, you're gonna have the problem. Um, I'm, are, you, are you sure you're going to have the problem? I'm, I'm not sure you're actually going to have the problem. I'm, I'm more than willing to bet my car. We actually have a raise hand from George too. I assume he wants to make a comment. Okay, let, me, let, me, let me just make a really, real quick comment on that, uh, Luis. Uh, my point is like, if you try to, if you, if you just you just imagine write down the equations up to second order, I think they're intractable. I yeah. think we are a long way of being able to say anything meaningful about the second order equations. But you might be right. But at this point, I think uh, I don't think we can say any much anything useful about them. I I have my I have my car. So, hey, so, let, let me get your car. <laughs> okay, very good. Um, a lot more that can be said here, but uh, well, I wanna, can I say just one thing? Can I say one thing? Um, okay. So, in principle, um, so okay, as Marcelo said, it'd be very hard to actually prove these things and go to high and high order because the calculations, you know, all the problems are going to show up again, in a sense that you know, problems in the sense that calculations are very, very hard. But at least this BDNK thing, just like Israel Sur, there is a way to formulate this from kinetic theory. So we know how to do that. So at least there is the hope that it comes from some microscopic theory in a well-defined coarse-grained uh, approximation. So I think, uh, you know, I, don't, I don't think your car, uh, um, there is any threat to your car at this point, but let's check. I mean, I think this this would be a nice thing for the future to check. No, no, but I mean, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a very trivial observation that what I'm making. Sure, sure. Trun truncated to first order, it's <laughs> perfectly fine. But eventually I'm gonna have the combination of higher derivatives that are all are even and odd, and there's no way I can control that. So I'm, I'm pretty sure once you go up, it's gonna be bad. So this is a very good discussion. I think we should definitely come back to this if we have time, but in the interest of time, uh, we'll be moving forward here to, to Pavel's talk. Sorry to anybody that wasn't able to ask what they wanted to ask. Um, but here we're gonna move to Pavel's okay. talk. Uh, and he gave a talk, hydrodynamic fluctuations beyond hydrodynamics. So I'll go right to the questions in the interest of time. Um, it seems that many relativistic hydro simulations in two plus one dimensions have already been done with solutions that seem to make sense and can match data. If the effects mentioned in your talk are so important, why don't we see evidence for their necessity in simulations done so far? Um, what does the KMS condition mean physically? How is this related to the physics of the calculated coefficients? Is there a connection to entry production? And uh, generally, how does this affect our conceptions of criticality and dynamic criticality? And at what point do, uh, what point should we see a dependence on our hydrodynamic formulations? Sorry, that's I should say, what point should we see a dependence on our, uh, on our hydrodynamic formulation? Um, so I'll give you about, let's say, Five, uh, three to five minutes to kind of answer that, and then we'll open the score the floor to uh, anybody. Uh, right. Uh, yeah. Sure. So about uh, first point. Uh, so the way these effects were first seen, they were actually first seen in um, in simulations of two plus one dimensional fluids. Um, um, that's that that's how they were discovered. So it's not like you know theorists came up with them. So they were seen in molecular dynamic simulations. Um, and how important uh, these effects actually are. Uh, so that uh, depends on um, scales, right? Uh, so the results that I showed, they were results at, you know, strictly speaking, zero spatial momentum, for example. Okay, so real fluid is contained in a container, so there's a cutoff for the spatial momentum. And of course, these are infrared effects. You need to go to very small momenta, very small frequencies to see those. Are those frequencies and momenta that are, you know, accessible? You really have to plug in the numbers. And another thing is, the, of course, the prefactors. The prefactor that's sitting there is this numerically large, is this numerically small, so that also matters. Right, you really have to plug in the numbers, and for each particular physical system, you have to, uh, you have to estimate. Um, second point is KMS condition. So KMS literally means you are in thermal equilibrium. So that's that's that that's that that's what it is. Uh, there is so the results that I showed are the results for uh, real time correlation functions in equilibrium. If you're not in equilibrium, you don't have KMS. So the effective theory would look um, you know, differently. So at least uh, maybe the degrees of freedom would be the same, but KMS would not, uh, would not be there. 
Um, now, is there a connection to entropy production? I wouldn't necessarily know how to say this because those coefficients are high derivative suppressed and uh, the entropy production already happens at, um, you know, first uh, order in derivatives. And so if the sublinear contribution are smaller, then we already, already know the sign of the entropy production from the normal viscosity and the conductivity. So I'm not sure um, if, uh, you know, those, uh, those could be constrained uh, by the entropy production. Um, and uh, the last question, com criticality, dynamic criticality. So that I really don't, don't know. So it's, uh, it's clear that, uh, you know, the, the very notion of normal, um, uh, normal um, uh, derivative expansion. So that's formulated, uh, formulated uh, assuming, um, assuming uh, finite correlation lengths. And um, uh, if there is infinite correlation lengths, then that effective theory will have to be somehow modified. I suspect many of the ingredients <laughs> will still um, uh, say will still will still stay, uh, but I I cannot just go and like say or oh, if you are at the you know <laughs> uh, liquid uh, you know water vapor critical point so that's the you know effective action that describes that I don't I cannot say that yet, uh, but I think many of the ingredients that go into into this construction of the of the effective action they they will uh, survive. Okay, great. Thanks a lot, that Stephen. Shorter than five minutes. Does anybody uh, have any questions directly for Pavel? I do. Um, it's just uh, I have a question here, and I think my hand's still up. Oh, sorry, I, I didn't see it. Yeah, yeah, your hand is up. Yeah, it's just that you know, for the stochastic transport coefficients. So in the end, of what are we gonna compute? Like, so how do they, what is the physics behind them? It's just, it's kind of hard for, I understand the concept. I understand the mathematics. I don't, it's not clear yet to me what they're doing. Like, do I expect entropy, you know, to increase because of them? So what is, give me something that I can put my hat on and, and start thinking. About uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're tricky in terms of thinking about them physically. And the reason they're tricky is because, uh, they, if you want to write down a Kubo formula for them, it will be given by non-retarded function, non-retarded Green's function. Okay, okay. Uh, it's, it's 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 and not not only it's uh, non-retarded, it's something that cannot be related to retarded to the retarded one by the fluctuation dissipation theorem, right? So you that that's why you do not see this at three levels, so to say. You do not see this in a classical hydro. You can only see this in loops, right? So it's a German defective action uh, that. Uh, contributes to observable retarded functions, but it only through loops. Uh, so, I mean, th that's why it's hard to give it an interpretation because it does not contribute at three level. Um, so, yeah, so perhaps, yeah, so they, the best thing I can, I, I have so far is that that's really the information that is contained in non-retarded functions. Okay, that so now leaks it leaks into the physically observable um, uh, retorted functions, and I don't have unfortunately a good physical intuition um, behind that. Okay. <clears throat> That's something directly they want to ask or say. If not, we can move on. All right, we'll move on in the interest of time. Trying to get back to some of those because there's some discussion going in the chat on a previous on the Skansi stock still. So we'll move on. And here we have um, Soren Schlichting just gave us a talk um, on non-equilibrium gradient functions of the energy momentum tensor. Um, so does the choice of the of RTA within a Bjorken, uh, within a Bjorken symmetric context uh, protect against instabilities that may occur if there was not rotational variance? Um, can this analysis be done with a full EKT QCD kernel? And how might we expect observables to change in that? Um, in that context. How does this sit in the context of Gabrielle's talk from Friday, which is maybe you have not had a lot of time to think about since then, um, but you know, if that's okay, that's fair, um, but maybe there can be some discussion there between both of you. And the general question, uh, switching from, I guess this is more generally for heavy ion collisions field, switching from a conformal pre-equilibrium to non-conformal hydro requires a large bulk. What do we do if we find that this large mismatch leads to a causalities, et cetera, et cetera, all the problems that we've talked about extensively during this workshop? Um, 
watching us today and Friday. Uh, so please start in if yeah, sure. Okay, so let me start with the with the second one, which is probably the probably the easiest address. So I mean, I, I didn't actually have a chance to see Gabriel's talk, but if I if I remember correctly, he talked about uh, somehow uh, uh, different kinds of matching you have to do in the relaxation time approximation. If, for instance, you consider momentum dependent um, relaxation times and things like this. So in this case, this was a momentum dependent independent relaxation time, and I mean energy momentum conservation is actually guaranteed by the way that we that we do the. I mean, do the matching. I'm actually not sure you could do, you could match in any other way, but maybe this was discussed by Gabriel. So I think we are fine in that regard. Um, just, a, just a quick comment there. So Gary, Gabriel did talk a lot about how all these different matchings you can do. And he actually showed that there were results that were dependent on the matching that you did. Okay, so, so maybe, yeah, so I'm, it's, it's on my list to actually watch the recording of that talk, but I didn't have audio <laughs> during that, that, that session, okay. So yeah, maybe, maybe there'll be something, something else interesting to do actually, then, so sure. that, that could simply be done, yeah. Um, can this analysis be redone with a full EKT QCD kernel? Um, the answer is um, certainly, I mean, certainly yes. Um, so, I mean, what has been done was to do this for young Mills kinetic theory now, um, um, I mean, in fact, that's what we're planning to do, to, to redo it actually with the full QCD kinetic theory. It's just going to be a lot more expensive, right? It's just, you know, you just have to run compli more complicated simulations. How might we expect observables to change? Yeah, I mean, that's the, I mean, that's the question in principle. I mean, I was surprised to kind of see such small sensitivities essentially to the underlying dynamics, which somehow has been, you know, I mean, this has been a, I mean, this has been part of a bigger story. I mean, we've seen this for the background. Now we're starting to see this also for perturbations. Um, um, so probably the, I mean, probably the changes are not gonna be, they're probably not gonna be dramatic. Although, I mean, we should, we should check, right? I mean, because at the end of the day, you know, we wanna, I mean, we wanna get to as, <laughs> to as close as QCD as possible, right? And so, I mean, we should certainly do the weak coupling QCD calculations to find out and, and somehow quantify this to what extent can we use this model or to what extent can we try to model the features of, of QCD there. But um, probably the changes are not gonna be dramatic, let's say, that's at least my expectation. Um, first question is, does the choice of RTA within a Björken symmetry protect against instabilities that may occur if there was not a rotational invariance? This I don't actually understand this question. So. Um, maybe we put that to the end. So let me instead ask, uh, answer the last one. Switching from conformal pre -equilibrium. Okay. So so yeah. So this is this this is a good point actually, right? So I mean, what we do is uh, I mean, a lot of the descriptions we've used for the pre-equilibrium stage are based on conformal symmetry, but then we run hydrodynamics with the QCD equation of state, and there's there's certainly a mismatch, right? Um, Probably what one should do from a practical point of view before we can do better is, uh, is somehow let that let that let that change relax back slowly. Um, so absorbing this into so to say the the, the, the bulk is, uh, not the bulk is, is yeah I mean the, the off equilibrium contribution to the bulk. Um, but I mean, really, what we have to do is we have to try to try to come up with extensions of uh, of, of you know somehow um, dealing with uh, with conformal symmetry breaking during the pre-equilibrium phase, right? And um, I mean, in principle, there are certain transport models which have this, uh, I mean, which include these effects. And um, maybe the first thing one should do is actually look at them and see whether you know what kind of behavior they give, right? I mean, um, but yeah, I mean, I think that's. Uh, uh, I mean that's I mean that's an important question that somehow lies ahead in, in terms of in terms of trying to trying to figure out how to include this. Yeah. yeah so I actually want to make a comment on this last question here because even going a little bit further, kind of some of the some of the best simulations that we trust in in heavy ion collisions that kind of predict the bit predict, for instance, v two of the data like really well is would be like music right where they they start with um, IP plasma initial conditions and which is uh, conformal symmetric and then they go and then they switch they do the same thing where they switch in uh to to non-conformal hydro and they it requires a, a large mismatch in the bulk and uh but if if that is able to fit the data so well and do so well in describing the physics and it turns out that this large mismatch leads to a causality and so what what does this mean i mean if if it's so if, if the data we're trying to fit is so robust that even when we do physics that is a causal we can fit the data 
What, what does that mean? I mean, do we have any hope? Well, I mean, I think there's features of the data that are, that, that are very robust and, 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 and that, you can, that you can essentially try to fit by different effects canceling out. But I mean, let me make, I mean, let me make one point, for instance, which is, you know, which is very sensitive to that early physics happening, which is if you actually knew the normalization of your initial energy and you were to, were to compute what is the final outcome in terms of number of particles produced and you don't readjust your initial energy density, then you would be super sensitive to all the evolution that happens in between. Now, in reality, we don't know either very precisely, okay? So we don't know how much energy was there right after the thing smashed, uh, and we have uncertainties in the evolution, okay? Um, so, so, so in some sense, this is also, I mean, this is a historically grown field, right? I mean, we're trying to do the best as we can <laughs> at any given stage of time, right? But um, I mean, that's, you know, that's then in part why you say, okay, there's not a, there's not a sensitivity to this and that. Uh, um, but that's, I mean, that's, for instance, one concrete example where I would think, okay, the uncertainties that maybe come from non-conformality are not that big because you're mostly talking about the hot regions of the plasma where most of the energy sit and there you're in the, there you're at high temperatures, okay. Um, where probably, you know, you could, you could talk about this. I mean, I fully agree. If you talk about somehow, you know, dilute edges at the, <laughs> of the fireball, you know, where temperatures are never very high, you have large non-conformality and then, you know, it's, things get very, very complicated. You also in the sector where QCD is very complicated and, and you want to describe that out of equilibrium. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, thank you so much to all the speakers. I think now, instead of focusing on any one speaker, um, I think I'll open the floor to anybody that wants to talk. In particular, there's a lot of conversation going on in the chat right now. I don't know if anybody that's involved in that discussion would like to bring that discussion to the forefront at the moment. Uh, but I do see a hand raised. Uh, so you can go ahead, uh, Hans. Hopefully I'm asking yeah. your name correctly. My, my question is uh, to Louis Lehner um, about this artificial relaxation time um, tau. Um, so in an earlier comment, you have said that um, the to, to test the independence of tau, you would um, pick some tau and then go to 10 times that tau and um, ten, then a factor 10 less of that tau. But I think um, that approach is really not good enough because um, what you know is that you will, would reprodu reproduce um, the correct theory that you want to model and the limit of tau going to zero. And what you actually have to show, I think, is that in the limit of tau going to zero, um, kind of your result is independent of tau or converges to some solution. And uh, sure, let me respond to that. So there are yeah. two, two things. So one, the original uh, theory uh, just is ill pose. I mean, is ill pose. Any problem dealt with the original theory is ill pose, uh, unless you restrict your initial data enough and you make darn sure that if you're doing this numerically, you have no high frequencies whatsoever. So the problem that numerically you will, so you this tau wants to control the UV side. Um, that invariably you will, will have. So the question here is what happened, so if you think of in terms of kind of Fourier modes, which is, I'm, I'm pushing a little bit to the argument, but let's, let's, uh, uh, and let's entertain this. So the, the, the low, the long wavelength part, the low frequency parts, those are at a scale that is very different from this tau. And this is what you're trying to guess or to gauge. The correction terms are small, your initial data should be within the regime of applicability. And your, the question is not to get the limit. You're, you're right from the formula point of view to recover the original theory, the tau should go to zero or infinity depending on how you, you're choosing it. But the true question is within the long wavelength modes and the correction that these terms bring uh, is the solution independent of that scale that you have just put in. If your system naturally evolves to the IR or evolves both in the IR and the UV, but use UV side is um, bounded. The example of the, the problem I gave, box phi is box, box phi is one example. 
then, um, then you're going to be fine. You're recovering, not the theory that you wrote, because the theory that you wrote is an artificial truncation that includes many, many more terms that you're not including. And then the, uh, the assumption or, the, or the, the basic argument is that the problems that you see in the UV are a byproduct of the truncation you introduced. And so if the EFT arguments are valid, then uh, the low frequency regime should stay put and this is what you're trying to, to get. So there, I mean, you're technically correct if you think your original system is the true system, but, this, but that's not. In, the, in, in this way of thinking, you're not, this is just a guidance of what should be happening in the low frequency regime and the high frequency regime is completely wrong. If you try to get there, then you're gonna see all the problems. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. All right, that was, um, so are there any other specific questions that uh, one would like to ask? There's, like I said before, there is a ton of discussion going on in the chat. If not, I can take it back because I believe um, at some point, Gabrielle had a question that he wanted to ask for during Disconzi's discussion. And I think that sparked a lot of discussion in the chat. Um, there's also uh, questions for Luis from Pavel and, um, and uh, Disconzi as well. Um, so, does anybody would like to take the floor right now? So Travis, Travis sorry, maybe I can ask my question. Oh, sorry, Marcelo, you, you have yeah, no, sorry to, Go ahead. No, no just because, just because uh, since, since I don't have uh, an option to raise the hand, I try to raise a thumbs up before for to enter. Yeah, yeah, so, the um, <laughs> yeah but this is just a quick question to, uh, to Louise. Uh, it's related to what George asked you at the, at, at the end. Uh, so, uh, I don't know much about these higher order theories of gravity, but a few of them that I looked, it seems that almost never people know if, if you choose a gauge, you can prove if the gauge propagates. So, uh, so, so is that something understood? Or are there some general result like that or is a case by case thing? So in general, it's a case by case, but it's, it's even worse than that. So if you, if you restrict yourself to the Kondensky theories, uh, which are all second order, then there is a better sense in which you can answer that question. Once you go to the R ones, which have higher order derivative operators, you, you have literally in the right hand side, the sixth derivative of the metric plus the, the first derivative times the fifth derivative and any old combination there is. There's, mm -hmm. there, there is no math that can even give you the, the, the right to even ask that question. This is why I was being very adamant in, in my uh, betting my car once you mm -hmm. deal with those, we have no idea. Um, and if you really want to scare mathematicians, you can just flash them and they will run away. Right. Okay, okay. Uh, cool. Uh, so Gabriel, you, you also had a question as well. So it's a question and then also maybe a comment regarding uh, the, the discussion that started, right? So, um, as far as I understand it, I mean, when you take the, the, well, what Marcelo presented just, just uh, today, there was a deep difference uh, to traditional uh, derivation hydrodynamics from gradient expansion, which to me is not related to the frame choice, which was the fact that you add also time derivatives, uh, time-like derivatives as well as space-like derivatives when you try to power count. When you, what you call first order essentially changed when you introduce this notion. Um, and you can do this in any frame. Of course, if you do it in another Eckhart frame, you get a bad theory, but you can still in principle do it in any frame. Um, and you could also do the usual gradient expansion in, in any frame, just with space like gradients. Um, and they will all be bad, right? I mean, so to me, if you do not use Landau frame, it does not guarantee any kind of theory that is well behaved. So to me, the essential difference here was the fact that they added these time derivatives, which essentially regulated the no hydro modes in, in, in traditional Navier Stokes theory. And then the theory became kind of stable and causal. Um, but at least to me, this is not guaranteed by a change of frame choice. So I would disagree with, with Kofton when he says that uh, their theory is what Landa wanted to do. I mean, I don't think Landa would have ever come up with this uh, theory in, in, in his reasoning, right? And even I would ask, uh, you know, Marcelo, that in principle, you could do the same thing in normal relativistic case, right? You could formulate your theory also even normal relativistically and you, wouldn't, you, you would not get traditional navier Stokes as well. And I have not seen this discussion about frame choice and all that in normal relativistic theories. I don't know if you guys have thought about also 
you know, reformulating hydro in a more general sense than just with GR. So that's just my, my comment and, and question. Uh, yeah, so, so, so maybe let me make a quick comment on that and then I think other people can jump in. Uh, I, I agree with, with you, Gabriel, uh, but I just don't, don't, don't see these two things as like say necessarily opposite in the sense that um, uh, if you imagine the way that if you go back to the 50s when Landau was trying to construct this theory or the 40s when Acker was doing, people were not even thinking in terms of gradient or derivative or any kind of expansion. They were, they were just trying to postulate an energy momentum tensor, so right? And I think in that sense is where the, the choice of frame comes in because they postulated something uh, where you didn't see any correction to the energy density, right? So the, the, the double contraction of the velocity to the energy moment and then density just gave you epsilon or what I was calling rho. And that's the choice of frame. And then, so they're not thinking in terms of the, any kind of expansion. So in that sense, I think you can, you can sort of blame the, the choice of frame uh, because you, you should just postulate T minu that, that form. So you, if you imagine the way we did, even though of course we have like you know, 70 years uh, uh, of physics you know, ahead of them. So we can think in terms of you know, expansions and things like that. But if, even if you imagine, don't, don't talk about expansion at all, just think, okay, well, I'm gonna postulate some energy momentum tensor that depends up to first order derivatives of the fluid variables. Uh, then that involves a choice of frame, right? Which tells you how to decompose the energy moment tensor into the reducible parts. So uh, I, I think the two things are related. You know, so it might be two different points of view, I guess. Once you have this point of view of the frame, then you can say, okay, so if I reinterpret this as a derivative expansion, then now I see that in, in that particular expansion, I have to include time derivatives. Th does that make sense? Uh, to me, it does make sense. I mean, I, I get your point. My, mm -hmm. uh, I think, in, in particular in your case, there is a connection, right? Because you see that certain frames are not possible in your theory if you want a physically meaningful theory. While in the traditional theory, uh, you know, grid expansion, all frames are bad, right? I mean, pretty much all frames are bad. Uh, and in Isostruit, I, I guess we don't know, right? Because no one has formulated Isostruit theory yet in an arbitrary frame. We just have Eckert and Landau, as far as I know. Uh, and in these two frames, it appears to be okay. But maybe also in this truth theory, you see issues with frame choices as well. If one looks into it, um, one has to check. But my only point is that in principle, theoretically, you can do anything in any frame you want. But of course, causality and stability maybe will uh, kind of fix your choices a little bit, or sometimes a lot, uh, like, like what you guys found. So I agree with you. Yeah. Um, maybe I can also make a comment uh, to uh, what uh, Gabriel just said. Um, so Gabriel, you mentioned that um, you can do the same thing in uh, normal non-relativistic fluids, like go to like some wacky frame, right? And find like extra time derivatives or whatnot. And yes, you absolutely can. And uh, my understanding is that the reason people simply didn't do it for non-relativistic Navier-Stokes is because nobody cared. So in non-relativistic Navier-Stokes, um, the problems with causality did not arise. So why, why bother? Uh, and um, more importantly, when you actually observe the actual fluid, <laughs> you know, you look at how the particles move. <laughs> so from that point of view, it's very natural for you to just choose Eckert frame and go with that. Now, uh, the way I think about those regulator parameters um, in um, BDNK theory, uh, I think about them, you know, from a twofold point of view. So one way is to maybe they give you something that parameterizes my, the microscopic physics, but, uh, from another point of view, I think one can give them a very uh, physical, a physical interpretation. Uh, so the reason these parameters arise is because of the frame choice. And the reason frame choices exist is because what we mean by temperature uh, or velocity uh, is essentially depends on uh, how you choose to define those things out of equilibrium. So you define temperature out of equilibrium using a thermometer. And if you have two models, you know, of different thermometers, you know, named by different brands, you know, of different shapes made out of different materials, right? So they give you, they will give you different temperatures if you stick them in exactly the same non-equilibrium state, right? So um, um, these uh, extra parameters that uh, sit uh, in this BDNK theory, I also think about them as really parameterizing the type of thermometer that you choose to use to define your out of equilibrium temperature or you know the velocimeter that you choose to use 
to define what you mean by out of equilibrium velocity. And, you know, they're really arbitrary choices there. And they're really parameters of like actual experimental devices that you would stick in your fluid and whose readings you would take to figure out what uh, that, you know, U mu is or what that T is that uh, sits in those equations. Okay. Uh, really quick, there's a, a, a question from Masad that is just starting to be answered in the chat. So if Masad would like to ask this question and then if uh, somebody who's already answered it might want to go ahead and try and answer it or, or Masad, would you rather that I read your question aloud to everybody? At Marcelo. Okay, well, um, Masad asked, let's see. Uh, he has a he says he had a question to BDNK. Um, and what setup do you think we can compare the formalisms without the artifacts of Bjorken and Gubser? Um, and I think Marcelo was already going about answering this question. So maybe Marcelo can just kind of inform us of what his answer yeah, is. So, 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 so if I understood that the question when you mean compare, you mean compare BDN, BDNK with, let's say, Israel Stewart. Is that right, Masood? That was your question? Yes, actually, I was asking this question because, as you said, it is very hard to uh, find the right uh, transport parameters into the, two, into the two theories and initial conditions that, that are similar, and we can talk about a comparison. Yeah, but yeah, with, yeah. I have a comment point. before. I have a comment before that. Uh, and I think in the Bjorken case, you can do it like, by comparing the uh, poles of the Borel transformation. Mm. If two poles are very close together, then you can, you can think that these two, two theories, these two initial conditions and transport par parameters are quite similar. Uh, mm -hmm. in, uh, I don't know if you have a, for example, we find, uh, want to simulate BDNK, uh, even with a simplified setup, how can we compare that with uh, MIS and Navier Stokes? That is yeah, that, 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 that's what I was more or less saying in the chat. You, uh, there, there are different ways. I think there's, there, there, there are some choices that need to be made because you need to make some choices of saying that you're gonna ignore certain things to say that uh, the two initial conditions are quote unquote the same, right? Because of course, you're, you're talking about different variables, but I'd say you have a notion of, a, of the viscous stress in Israel Stewart, you have a notion of the viscous stress on the BDNK. So you can try to set up things in a way that for example, these two things are uh, the same order of magnitude for your initial conditions, for example, right? Uh, and, and then run your simulation and see what happens. Uh, maybe somebody has some more well-defined thought of how to do that, but that's, the only way I can see how you could compare these things. Uh, but in practice, how to choose these initial conditions that you can actually say that they are similar or they are close in some sense, uh, we, we haven't given much thought to that yet, you know, uh, but uh, that's definitely something that has to be addressed. Thank you. With that, um, I know there's a lot more discussion going on, but <laughs> we've already gone even over an hour. Um, so, Thank you everyone for participating in the discussion here. Thanks to the speakers. This was uh, really nice. And I'll hand it over to George and uh, um, Michael Heller. Okay, very good. Thanks a lot, Travis. Great job. Um, so yes, yeah, so we are at the end here. Um, so I'd like uh, on behalf of the organizers to thank all the speakers of the first day, um, the speakers of the second day, also our chairs, and it's also especially Dekrayat, who was a moderator uh, on Friday, and also Travis who was a moderator uh, of today. So Dekrat is a, a PhD student at Kent State University, and um, and Travis is a is a PhD student here in Illinois. Um, but yeah, so I think I'd like to thank you all. This was great. I think there were several discussions and many other things to come. Uh, Michal. Yeah, I, I guess we'll take take over from there, and, and thanks uh, everyone for for uh, contributing. Um, just a closing word. Uh, we are uploading, or I, actually we uploaded almost all the talks uh, online to the workshop website. 
and uh, the videos from the talks are all available from Friday and some of them are also available from today and we're going to upload all of them by tomorrow. So basically everything that happened in the workshop like is going to be documented if you want to come back to it. And uh, the closing word is, is, is that virtual meetings are, I guess, like not as bad as, as they sound uh, if uh, the talks are diluted and uh, the topic is focused. So I think it was a very fun, very fun meeting with uh, extremely low cost, uh, actually no cost at all, uh, with uh, very low carbon footprint as compared to what it would cost to bring all of us uh, to the same place. Maybe with a bit less, uh, you know, in-person discussion, but uh, what can we do? I mean, like, we do our best in, uh, in this uh, difficult uh, time. So, uh, well, let's hope that there's gonna be a bigger uh, hydro uh, workshop, uh, hopefully uh, next year, maybe like towards the second half of next year. And yeah, I mean, happy holidays. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Bye bye.